This morning, I'm starting something new for the new year. We have the video recording there, gentlemen. Excellent. The Great Adventure. The Great Adventure. This is going to be two or maybe three sermons this month. Just a short little series, just to kind of pump us up and get us fired up for 2019. Part one is set sail. Now, I'm not the uh, most adventurous guy you'll meet. I often look at some guys like John McDonald and Rich there at Camp Chickatawk, and they're like going on canoe trips all the time and climbing mountains and doing all this crazy stuff, and I think, man, that's not me. I'm quite happy to sit at home and watch TV or Netflix or whatever. Um, but I have been on a few adventures in my life, and... Um, some pretty great adventures, really. One, I remember when I was, I think, in elementary school still, probably grade six or something like that. Um, I went on a backwoods, three-night camping trip, canoe trip in Kejimakujik National Park with my dad and with some other men and boys, and it was awesome. Um, 2008, spent a month traveling around Kenya. That was quite an adventure. Um, and the best probably though, I think one of the most significant adventures that I've been on in my life was probably when I was in junior high and I took a trip to Isle Haut. Now let me tell you about Isle Haut. Here is where it's located, out in the middle of the Bay of Fundy. Some of you have probably seen Isle Haut uh, as you've looked out on the Bay of Fundy. You can see it really well from where I grew up in Nova Scotia. So you see Berwick there in Nova Scotia. Well, Aylesford, where I grew up, is just next door to Berwick. And when you go up over the mountain and go towards the shore, uh, you look out and you see Isle of Hope. <clears throat> and uh, it's pronounced different ways. In, in Kings County, we, call it, we said Isle of Hope, um, But French, French people call it Isle Hope, which is probably a better pronunciation. Um, and uh, different people call it different things. But for us, it's Isle of Hope. And... Uh, uh, if you go to the... Oh yeah, no, stay on that slide for a second. So the, the, this island, the first people to use it were the Mi'kmaq people, obviously, going back thousands and thousands of years. And then about 400 years ago, Samuel de Champlain visited Isle of Haute and uh, explored the island, noticed that there was a freshwater spring there, made all these notes. You can read his, his notes about visiting Isle of Haute. It's pretty cool. Uh, he gave it the name Isle of Haute, which means high island in French because of the tall cliffs. Um, Malseat and Mi'kmaq use it as a meeting place. Actually, there was they did an attack on Port Royal, which is down uh, further down past Annapolis in Nova Scotia. And the Mi'kmaq and Malseat teamed up. They met at Isle of and planned out their attack and then went and attacked Port Royal together. So was, there's a lot of history there. Uh, at the expulsion of the Acadians in the 1700s, um, some of them escaped to the island by canoe and spent a winter there before coming to New Brunswick. If you go to the next slide... This is what it looks like from, uh, from the water as you're approaching Isle of Hope on the Nova Scotia side. And it's, it's kind of a mysterious island. Uh, sometimes, it's funny, I don't know, different times of day, different light, different weather conditions, it seems like it changes size. Sometimes you look out and it seems like it's right there and it's huge and it's not very far away. And then other times it seems like it's way off in the distance. It's kind of this weird thing. And sometimes it almost looks like it moves. There's actually a legend that every seven years the island moves. Right? Which it doesn't, obviously. But that's the legend. And, and so it's kind of got this it's shrouded in mystery. And when it's foggy, you can't see it. Um, and so it's just like, it's really, it's, it's this island that when you grow up where I grew up, you always see it and you always wonder about it. And of course, there's all kinds of um, legends about Captain Kidd and other pirates who've got buried treasure there. Um, of course, I think just about every island off Nova Scotia has Captain Kidd's treasure on it. Um, but, I mean, this is, this, is, this is the legend. People have gone out there trying to find the treasure. Uh, nobody lives on it. And as far as I knew growing up, nobody ever went to it. It was just there, and it was off limits. And you do have to get special permission to go to the island. It's a protected area. So it's just there. It's, it's just there, and it's this thing that you wonder about growing up. Now, I was in Venturers. I was in Beavers. Cubs, Scouts, and then Ventures, which was the, the top thing. And um, in Ventures, we like to go on adventures and camping trips and things. And so somebody had the idea, why don't we go on a camping trip to Isla Haute? So we got permission from the Coast Guard, and we started planning our trip. And the next thing you know, here was two or three adults and a whole bunch of junior high and high school students 
chartering a fishing boat from Harborville en route to Isla Hote. It's about 18 kilometers uh, from the shore. And uh, we did this boat ride out and we saw seals and seabirds and a shark. I mean, this was thrilling. This was exciting. This was an adventure for us. I'd never done anything like this before in my whole life. We get there. There's no dock. So when you arrive at Isla Hote, you have to actually... You have to actually jump out of the boat and into the water and carry your pack above your head and, and swim slash wade to shore. So that's what we did. And uh, then the fisherman leaves us with the promise that in two days' time he'll return at high tide. <clears throat> and so here we are, alone on an island in the middle of the Bay of Fundy. Let me tell you a little bit about the island. If you go to the next picture, uh, this is a aerial shot of it. Um, there's a large, flat, rocky beach on the eastern side. That's that point down there with the little inland lagoon, a little saltwater lake that's there. And then the rest of it's all this tree covered and these huge cliffs, 100 meter cliffs on the sides. Um, you can't see it in this picture because the tide is up, but when the tide goes out, at the point of that easternmost point, you see a little bit of a sandbar jutting out there. Well, that continues out. That sandbar goes out for about 400 meters. And you can go out there and walk out, and then you're like standing out in the middle of the Bay of Fundy, which is pretty cool. It's surrounded by water. There's this freshwater spring near where we set up camp on the north side of the north point of that little inland lake, the spring that Samuel de Champlain found. And uh, we used that to fill our water bottles. It's good water. Um, and this narrow beach all around the island. So this is what it looks like. Uh, next slide. Here is a shot taken from uh, that lake looking up onto the island. And so we spent this weekend exploring the island, hiking an old overgrown road that leads to the site of a former lighthouse where you can see the found old foundations. And now there's just an old light tower there and a wooden helicopter pad. And we had wonderful campfires where leaders spun tall tales and told us legends of the island. And I have to say, we felt like we were the coolest people in the world that weekend. And maybe, just maybe, we actually were. <laughs> it was one of those truly unforgettable experiences, an adventure that leaves a mark on you for a lifetime. And I absolutely want to go back someday. I want to gather up some of my old venture pals and take a trip back to the Isle of Here is what I'm getting at this morning. Here's why I'm telling you this whole story. We have all been invited to join God on a great adventure. The Christian life was never meant to be boring. And yet most of us, I would say, end up in a rut somewhere along the way. And maybe we end up in multiple ruts. <laughs> Peaks and valleys. And we're in those valleys and those ruts and those slumps the excitement about serving Jesus, the passion, the fire, it's gone. It just fizzles out. Now, that's not terrible. The Christian life, this side of heaven anyway, is not meant to be a permanent emotional high. Okay? Sometimes we think that way, like, oh, if I'm not excited and fired up all the time, that my faith is in jeopardy. No. That's not what Christian, Christianity is not supposed to be, a permanent emotional high. So if, you, if your walk with God is consistent but dull, well, at least it's consistent. <laughs> but it's also not quite what God intended for us. Our purpose as human beings is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Enjoy Him. See, He wants more for us than the mundane, daily, boring Christianity. He didn't come and die for us to twiddle our thumbs and scroll through Facebook and wish for snowstorms on Sundays so that we can stay home from church. How do we get into these slumps and these spiritual ruts? Well, next slide. There's lots of different ways that we can get into these ruts, things that can cause them. Sin, I mean, when we sin, when we get into a habit of sin, a pattern of sin, we distance ourselves from God intentionally. And that causes that separation, that divide, and our passion to serve God dies down because we're, we're committing sin. We're living in sin. Um, discouragement. I mean, oftentimes we're not feeling well. We're not able to do things we used to do. Maybe we're getting older and we're getting discouraged because of that. We're fighting depression. 
and so on and so on. So we kind of resign ourselves to spiritual boredom. Well, this is going to be my new normal, I guess. That the Christian life is just this routine, boring thing. Distractions, bad habits, we lose focus. We get, we get focused on things that don't matter and prioritizing those things. We get busy. I mean, this is a big, I think this is a big thing, right? So that you're not even really thinking about the kingdom of God. Because you're thinking about your job, you're, you're thinking about getting groceries, doing your budget, and washing the dishes, and doing the laundry, and getting kids off to sports, and making it to that meeting, and your homework, or whatever you've got to do. So part of the reason that we don't, I think, that we don't live this adventurous Christian life that God wants for us, is because we don't slow down long enough. We don't Sabbath well. We're not in the habit of slowing down to give attention to what matters most. And then I think maybe the main reason <clears throat> that we get into these spiritual ruts is that it's easy. The easy thing to do is to live a mundane Christian life. When we took this trip to Isla Hope, we had to plan. It took work. It took money. The easier option would be not to bother. Just to keep looking at the island from a distance and always wonder what it would be like to go explore it but do nothing about it. And I'm afraid that our Christian lives can be like that too. Well, you know, I'd love to serve Jesus with that kind of excitement and joy and passion that other people do, but I don't think I have it in me. That's a lot of work. And so I'm just going to observe from a distance. You know, we see people serving Jesus with a joy and a sense of excitement and doing semi-crazy things for God. Being like Jesus. You know, you read books about missionaries and things and you go, wow, isn't that something? Man, that's amazing. That's so inspiring. And then we go back to our TV show. <laughs> Too much work. The normal Christian life ought to be consistent, solid, steady, yes. But not particularly boring. Next slide. When you read about the disciples three years with Jesus, and then you read about their experiences in the book of Acts, the last word that you would use to describe their lives is boring. Rather, you might wor use words like daring, risky, reckless, even adventurous. I mean, how can you read the book of Acts and not think, man, these guys lived a reckless, daring, adventurous life. Mission trips that they took, miraculous encounters, sermons in interesting places, storms at sea, huge crowds, persecution, arrests, prison escapes, resurrections, international church meetings, shipwrecks, snake bites. I mean, this was the life of the apostles in the first century. This was the normal Christian life. Somehow that's morphed today into following, where following Jesus mostly consists of going to church and trying to be a good person. The normal Christian life is supposed to be a life lived on mission for Jesus, like the disciples. A life where we can't be satisfied with our mundane routines anymore because there's so many more people out there for us to radically love and serve and share Jesus with through kindness and words, and a whole lot of messy grace. When we get into that place, that place where we're in the groove, where we're living on mission, where we're doing semi-crazy things for the Lord on a regular basis, we rediscover, or discover for the first time, the adventure of following Jesus. Where we're not just living in our rabbit holes and doing the same old things day in and day out anymore, but rather we find ourselves regularly getting off the mainland and setting sail for an adventure. Taking a risk and doing something kind of crazy once in a while. Something that will make a difference in another person's life. Something that will take you deeper with God. Something that will cause you to have to cling to Him more tightly than ever before because you're pushing the limits of your own natural abilities. In John chapter 20, verses 21 to 22, we see the resurrected Jesus come to his disciples. They're afraid, they're scared, they're hiding out. And Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. 
Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is quite a scene. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's huge. You think about what Jesus came and did. The kind of life that he lived. The kind of sacrifice that he made. The kind of prayer that he had. The kind of devotion that he had to the Lord. You study the life of Jesus and everything that he came to do. He even died for his mission. And then he says, As I came, as God sent me, so I am sending you. Man, that's a big deal. And I love that he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. It's not saying, you've got to do this alone. You've got the Holy Spirit with you. Peace be with you. Anybody here seen or read the book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Anybody know that? Yes. You know at least a little bit about that. Well, in that, in that movie, I've, 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 I don't know if I've read the book, but I've certainly seen the new movie. Um, Charlie Bucket gets this golden ticket. If you go to the picture there, there's the Wonka's golden ticket. There's a few of these golden tickets that are inside chocolate bar wrappers and they're scattered around the world. And a handful of these kids find the golden tickets. And the golden tickets give them permission to go to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory and to get a great tour with Willy Wonka himself. <clears throat> and when they go into this chocolate factory, it's not a normal chocolate factory. I mean, it is a wild experience. And, and it is just unbelievable, this chocolate factory. Well, I want to just say this. Jesus has given you a golden ticket. Jesus has given you a golden ticket. And he's saying, come join me on a great adventure. Come join me on, on, an, on an adventure that is going to blow your mind. That is going to take you places you never dreamed. Come change the world with me. A pastor friend once told me that his goal in life was to change the world. I said, you know, what, what, what is sort of, you, you know, your... Your goal or your mission, your vision. He's like, I want to change the world. And I thought at the time, I thought, well, that's a little over the top, don't you think? I mean, who says that? I mean, I want to change the world. But you know what? The more I think about that, he's dead right. He's abs- he hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly what God is inviting all of us to do, to change the world. If you think, think about it. God's purpose and intention is to restore all nations, all peoples, all cultures, indeed all of creation, from the sinful rebellion of humanity and its effects. That's kind of his whole thing. And our work, our role, is to participate with God, helping to achieve his purpose until Jesus returns. I mean, that's the invitation that we have. That's the golden ticket. Come change the world with me. Come join me. That's what it means to be part of his kingdom. Now, I don't know what you think, but to me that sounds like a life of adventure, excitement, joy, purpose, passion. Sign me up! That's what I want to be a part of! I'm sick of boring Christianity! I'm sick of stale religion! I've had my fill of lukewarm half-heartedness. I'm tired of that! It's not working for me anymore. I want to change the world. I want to go on a great adventure with Jesus. How about you? Jesus said in John 10, 10, He said, I have come that you may sit and look at the wall and be bored. No, that's not what He said. I said, I have come that they or that you may have life and have it to the full. The full experience of living. That's what I want. And praise God, that's what God wants for me. We have all been invited to join God on a great adventure. And here's another thing. We become our true selves when we embrace the adventure. When do you feel the most alive? What gets your heart beating? A smile spread across your face. For me, it's when I do stuff that's a little bit crazy. (laughs) It's when I run off a dock and jump into a lake. Or when I fly down the sliding hill on my kid's sled at breakneck speeds. Or 
like the time I went for an unplanned swim in Maggie's Falls, right? Just go for it. Just jump in. Uh, it's enjoying a scary movie that makes me feel all weird inside for like an hour afterwards. It's cranking up some nutty song on full blast and having a dance party in my living room with a bunch of kids, right? Those are the kinds of things that, that make me feel joyful and excited and alive. Every November, the kids and, and I climb up onto the roof of our garage and we throw our half-rotten jack-o'-lanterns onto the driveway for our annual pumpkin smash. Now, for now, the twins, they just sort of climb onto the roof of the minivan. But I think by next year, they'll be on the roof with us as well. Um, it's a little bit crazy, and it's a tiny bit dangerous, and it's a little bit scary, and it's a whole lot of awesome. And there's just something about doing semi-crazy things sometimes. It just makes me feel like I'm enjoying what it means to be human the way God intended. And I probably never felt more like this, more like a true human being, more like I was really making the most of life than when I hopped on a fishing boat and set sail for Isla Hote. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you're in Christ, if you're saved, if you're born again, Jesus is reshaping you. He is the potter, we are the clay. And when we get into his hands, he begins working us into something much better. He chips away the shame, the sin, the wounds. He carves off the guilt and the lies that we've believed. He removes our wickedness and he replaces it with his holiness. He wants us to be free from the curse of sin and to look more like him. He wants us to become who he originally intended us to be. Our true selves. See, the old me is not the true me. The new me is the true me. I am who he says I am. Now we're all works in progress. We're all works in progress, for sure. But, if we know Jesus as our Savior, we are in the hands of the Master Carpenter. The same Jesus, listen to this now, the same Jesus who designed galaxies and atomic particles, who dreamed up watermelons and elephants and peacocks, who fit together our solar system and fit together our genetic code. That same Jesus wants to transform your life. That same Jesus, if you get into his hands, he's going to do an amazing work in your life. You are in good hands if you're in the hands of Jesus. So the best place to be is in the zone when we stop trying to work against the master carpenter. When we stop trying to fight against his plan for our lives. And instead, we surrender Surrender. Say that word. Surrender. Surrender to His work and to His will in our lives. When we say, I trust you, Jesus. Do your thing. Take charge. And when you get to that place, buckle up because the adventure is going to begin. It's like the Hobbit, an unexpected journey. Man, He's going to take you on an unexpected journey. The call to an adventurous Christian life, this is important, is not the same as saying that you need to do a lot more stuff or do a lot more church stuff. Rather, it's an invitation to reprioritize your whole life. In fact, depending on where you're at today, it may be a call to do less. The call to an adventurous Christian life, to embrace who God designed you to be. It may be a call to do less, to slow down the pace of your routine so that, go to the next slide, so that you can break free from being busy and yet bored. Can you relate to that? I know I can. Man, there's so many times I am busy and yet I'm bored because I'm doing the wrong things. I'm busy with the wrong stuff. Break free from being busy yet bored to being less busy and more engaged in the joyful and exciting and reinvigorating experience of walking in step with God. On the island, Isla Hope, there's no strict schedule, 
There's no deadlines, no hurried pace. The whole pace slows down. And you become increasingly aware of your surroundings. Your food is more delicious. Your water is more refreshing. You pay attention to the breeze on your face and the sounds of the birds and the waves. You feel like sitting a while, chatting around a campfire, so you do that. If you want to take a walk and explore something, you can do that too. If you want to go have a nap or play cards or read a book or write a poem or draw a picture, go for it. No guilt, no pressure. Now you're thinking, well, that sounds like vacation. And that's kind of my point. Don't wait for one or two weeks a year to live like that. Everyday life can have glimpses of that. Of course, you can't. You have a job. You have responsibility. You have to do that stuff. But what we could learn is to capture elements of that. Every day, taking the time to breathe, to recenter on Jesus and the Spirit, to stop stressing about the schedule or the finances or world affairs or how we're feeling or whatever is stealing our attention and robbing our joy and to make room. Next slide. Make room. Make room for the adventure. We need more margin in our lives. More space for the Holy Spirit to work. Make room for discovering the daily opportunities of the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we will begin to transform into the human beings God designed for us to be, becoming more like Jesus, just like God intended. Behold, the new has come. All right, to, to close. At the beginning of this new year, the invitation for you is to set sail. Now, I know it's a cliche, whatever. But the point is this. Throw caution to the wind. Embrace the adventure of following Jesus. Don't settle for the same old, same old. Don't settle for, ah, I'm glad I'm a Christian, but it doesn't really affect my life in any dramatic way. God is calling us to something greater. He's inviting us to take our faith one step further. Inviting us to take our friendship with Him one step deeper. Inviting us to experience Him and His purposes in our lives in new ways. Inviting us to join Him in changing the world in little ways and maybe even big ways. So stop playing it safe. Embrace the risk. Plunge into the adventurous relationship that God wants to have with all of us. Amen? Amen. 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 Next Sunday... Andrew Dreyer will be speaking. I'll be here, so don't use that as an excuse to stay home. I'm still going to be here, and I'm going to notice if you don't come. Um.